Hello and welcome to today's webinar, which is becoming one of my favorite topics. It's on the top electricity value network trends for 2018. I'm Mary Caldwells. I'm product marketing leader for GE Digital, and a part of my role is helping power and utility companies start and successfully navigate their digital transformation journey. It's my pleasure to be with you today and to be your host and moderator. But to begin with, I want to just cover a few brief housekeeping announcements. First of all, this webinar, it, it, it's being recorded, and it's going to be available on demand for about a year. So if you hear some interesting nugget and you want to come back and revisit it, feel free to do that um, or share it with your colleagues. Uh, today's event will be interactive, so we would encourage you to disable any of the pop-up blockers that you may have installed. They will interfere with uh, certain aspects of our web conference. For an enhanced view of our presentation, you just need to click the Enlarge Slides button. It's located in the gray bar that's right above the slide window. Uh, you can download the PDF version of the slide presentation. All you have to do is click the blue slide icon. It's located at the bottom of your console. There's also additional content like um, white papers that will be available in the green um, resource list icon. So throughout the presentation, I want to encourage you to ask questions at any time. You can simply click on the Q&A icon at, at the bottom of the screen and type it into the question box that's going to appear, and then you'll just hit Submit. We're going to be addressing as many questions as we can at the bottom of the webinar, and we'll follow up directly with any of the unanswered questions that um, we may not be able to get to if we run out of time. So you know, be bold, ask those questions. We'll definitely try to address them. So our new and always popular annual white paper on the top 10 electricity value network trends for 2018 will be made available to all of the attendees after the webinar, and this paper will be delivered in a separate email to you soon. So now let's talk about today's hosts and uh, an agenda. So as I, as I mentioned, I'm Mary Caldwells, um, but it is my pleasure to introduce some of our distinguished guests with us is Bill Morelli. He is the Senior Director of IT and Networking for IHS Market. Bill manages the core strategy, personnel, research, analysis, and commercial planning for the division. Currently, Bill's primary focus is connectivity and the Internet of Things. The division he oversees also includes data centers, compute electronics, smart cities, cloud computing, enterprise IT, enterprise and service provider networking, and also IT security. So he's covering a lot of great topics that are perfectly relevant for today. He's published numerous reports on the global market for the Internet of Things, connected devices, mobile handsets, uh, smart and converged devices, and IoT, um, sorry, IoT uh, technologies. And uh, many of his articles include, have been included in major networks, I'm sorry, major net newspapers and magazines such as the Washington Post, Bloomberg, and Business Week, and the New York Times. With him is one of our, uh, his colleagues, Sam Wilkinson. He's the Associate Director of Solar and Storage for IHS Market. Sam is responsible for, responsible for researching the PV inverter market and the PV module and polysilicon supply chain, and he works closely with le leading global suppliers to really develop a detailed analysis on these markets. He's been responsible for establishing primary research reports that focus on solar demand and policy, and it really complements IHS's market, IHS market's extensive research of the complete PV supply chain. So building on his experience in the solar research team, Sam has established the IHS market uh, power technology coverage for energy storage as well, and he covers a wide range of topics within this really fast developing sector. And finally, we have Scott Brown. He is the Director of Market Development at GE Power Digital, and Scott has deep experience in the power and utility industry. Having joined GE after working as a Senior Advisor for Angie, where he consulted to global management teams on the development and launch of new energy solutions. Before that, Scott worked with NRG Energy in a variety of leadership positions across business development, operations, and new technology. Scott's worked as a management consultant for several firms, serving uh, numerous utility, technology, and industrial customers. So without further ado, um, what we'll be discussing today is really just an overview of what we are, have identified as the top 10 electricity value network trends for 2018. We're going to ask a couple of poll questions along the way, so we really want to encourage you to participate. 
We're going to have a very interactive trends discussion between our uh, various speakers, uh, and then we'll wrap up the session with a Q&A. So now I would like to hand over the presentation to Scott. Scott, can you uh, take it from here? Great. Thanks, Mary. Well, looking forward to walking through um, these trends with everybody on the phone. Um, I'm going to walk through a few just to kick off the discussion, um, and these are going to represent some of the deeper dives we have um, over the next hour. So the first one is, is the acceleration of di digital that's shifting the power and utility markets. Um, we're seeing a lot of change in this space, and we'll walk through that in a little bit more detail. Uh, the second one, edge drives cloud adoption. We're going to walk through um, the edge and the cloud relationship and, and how they are really reinforcing each other for some of these industrial customers. The next one we'll be walking through in more depth is the need for transitional technology. One after that is adaptive security protection becomes the imperative. Number seven is the tipping point for electric vehicles is on the horizon. And then the last one that we'll be hitting on is artificial intelligence, AI, moves to the realm of reality. So before we jump in to those in a bit more detail, maybe I'll turn it back over to Mary for kind of a quick interactive exercise with the group. All right. Well, thanks, Scott. Um, and by the way, you know, the, the other trends that were identified on that agenda slide We'll be covering more in more depth in the paper that will follow on. Uh, we wish we had more time to, to really cover each and every one of them, but we wanted to just focus on those top five for today's discussion, especially given the expertise that we have. So um, for the poll, um, would you, um, I was just wondering, do I need to push the poll? Is, is there a button I'm supposed to push? Oh, okay. Sorry about that, everyone. So what are the top three trends that are going to affect the organization, that you, your organization particularly, that, that the most in 2018? So, I mean, obviously you want to look at a longer-term horizon, but for 2018, what do you think is going to be your top, top um, um, trends that are affecting you? So we, we mentioned a few, the acceleration of digital that's shifting power and utility markets. Uh, there's also the edge driving cloud adoption. Are you seeing digital twins unlocking true digitalization? Do you see the need for transitional technologies um, or the practical application of collaborative robotics? How about adaptive security protection becoming the imperative in your organization? Do you see e-vehicles as the tipping point that's uh, on the immediate horizon or artificial intelligence that uh, will move to the realm of reality? And you could also select from the poll the empowered digital workforce with, uh, to see if that's going to be a real game changer for you or whether you're keeping an eye on block, blockchain as an enabling technology for the shared electricity economy. I think those are really kind of interesting um, polls uh, or options that you'd be able to select. So please uh, select from, from this list. Uh, you can select up to three options for your poll, and uh, we're going to be really curious to see of the attendees that are on today's webinar what uh, what you really think are the the hot or important uh, uh, subjects uh, that uh, are impacting your organization. So, what do you think, guys? Um, let's see what the results say. Wow, the top one is the acceleration of digital that's shifting power and utility markets. Um, what do you think? I'm, I'm, then, then the second and third choices are edge driving cloud adoption and, uh, oh, actually it's not in, in order. So let's see, we've got the acceleration of digital at 66%. We've got the tipping point for e-vehicles coming in at 47%. And uh, artificial intelligence at 28 and blockchain at 33%. So that's really, really, really interesting, but uh, a nice, a uh, span of choices between all of the different um, poll choices. What do you think, Scott? Are you surprised by what they've uh, picked as, as the top ones? No, I think those are not terribly surprising. I think it's, it's interesting to see blockchain kind of emerging given kind of where we are in the adoption life cycle and, and the potential it poses to the industry. I know that we're not going to go into great depth around that particular topic, but we can touch on that 
um, throughout different aspects of this presentation. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. I think you're going to get most of your top trends covered on today's webinar. So let's continue on. Um, and I'm going to hand this back over to uh, and kick off the real top trends discussion. So, Scott? Perfect. Thank you. Um, and I know we've got a lot of leading utilities on the line. So I think, you know, this first trend, and I think as you saw in the poll res results, is not surprising. Um, I think across the power and utility space, we're all seeing the acceleration of digital, really transforming assets, systems, processes, customer interactions. Uh, the World Economic Forum put together a really nice study recently um, that they've published, and I would encourage everyone to access that. Um, but within that study, um, they think the digitalization of electricity could unlock $3.1 trillion in industry and societal value over the next decade. That is just a staggering number when you really think about it. And then if you look at the bubble chart in the slide, you can see how they really kind of organized that value. And, and the two areas that I'm going to call out here on this slide is the, the biggest bubble on the chart and really to the far right and the, the one around asset performance management. And that's really how do you unlock the value that is tied up in those existing assets. Um, and, and certainly within GE, um, as an asset manufacturer and as a software company that really focuses on assets, this is one area where we are particularly interested and invested alongside our customers. The other one that I wanted to touch on was, was really um, the, 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 the blue bubble kind of furthest at the top, which is really focused on um, real-time supply and demand platforms. So I think grid optimization and ag aggregation is also driving significant value for society and really helping manage and orchestrate the important functions and interactions across the power grid for the various stakeholders. These stakeholders include utilities, DSOs, DSOs, and an emerging class of distributed energy resources. And we'll touch on um, a few of the developments in that space um, where we are actively working um, that's going to be interesting to walk, to walk through. This next slide is an example of, of a customer that we, that we at GE work closely with and is really undertaking a pretty um, significant transformation. Um, so the New York Power Authority, NIPA, is, is really the first fully digital utility and is really committed to driving digital throughout the business to drive better outcomes for their stakeholders and constituents. As you can see on this slide, the impact is really meaningful. They're driving better reliability, reduced downtime, lower O&M costs, and this digital transformation is expected to result in approximately $1 billion of value creation. In fact, just this week, NYPA gave a special tour of their M&D Center in New York um, to guests really from around the world, and, and that facility is serving as the brain for this digital transformation. Um, so they've really been leaning in um, to this effort. They see enormous value um, for stakeholders across New York. They really want to build out a digital ecosystem that focuses on value creation and, and really business model transformation. Um, and, they've, and, and they've been a great partner um, to GE throughout that process. I mentioned how, how the grid and, and the marketplace is starting to transform and represents a pretty significant um, value opportunity. Um, NIPA, as I just mentioned, happens to, to also sit in, in one of those states here in the United States, New York, that is really at the forefront of, of some of these numerous market changes as a result of distributed energy re resources. Um, with a large number of market participants, technology, and value streams emerging, we must also begin to rethink technology to allow for greater modularity, flexibility, and connectedness. As an example, today, trading is primarily happening at the TSO level, which is focused on ancillary services, capacity markets, et cetera. 
we really think that moving forward, energy trading will become fragmented in both the services and the number of players, such as the emergence of prosumers, microgrids, storage, etc. These new players will not necessarily use a full market trading platform, but they're really each looking for a discrete piece of that. Further, some of the technologies that, such as blockchain, which we highlighted earlier, um, has the potential to change the business model and really the role for the TSOs and DSOs moving forward. One of the efforts that we're really excited about is the ongoing work, work with PJM and ISO New England which is helping us create a next generation market platform that has some of that greater modularity to support all participants, drive higher grid utilization, and lower costs utilizing di digital twin models. The next trend, edge drive cloud adoption, um, is really an important one that we're seeing both from the industrial part of our business as well as the software part of our business. And really, this gets down to for industrial customers, for power customers, um, decisions must be made with a line of sight to the economic results. And, and, and really, the amount of valuable plant data available largely remains untapped. So power plants have a vast number of variables and configurations that can change in an instant. Many operational changes have trade-offs and long-term consequences that are difficult to determine. And the pace of change is increasing faster than operators can adapt manually. So as we think about edge driving cloud adoption, it's really about when does the operator, when do the various stakeholders need the data that is coming off the assets? What is that latency um, or, 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 or speed requirement? How do decisions get made and how do we right size those feedback loops so that people are making the most appropriate decisions with the right set of data at the right time. I think that's Scott, this is Bill. Uh, just a quick comment there, and, and that's really a trend that we've been seeing, and I think you hit on a couple of key points there, is, is trying to make intelligent uh, decisions about where you need the right level of processing and what your ultimate end goal is. So where latency is a significant concern, you really want to push more of the processing to the edge. Uh, you want to have more intelligent devices able to do some level of analytics on the data that they're collecting, uh, but you still want the ability to leverage the power of the cloud and being able to integrate into a broader uh, data set and be able to perform more powerful analytics than you'd be able to do at the edge functionally. Uh, so that's where we see the edge and cloud kind of both playing an important role in uh, a lot of these uh, uh, rollouts moving forward. Right. Bill, I, this is Mary. I think that's really an important point because you're not saying edge or cloud you're really emphasizing and cloud, and it sounds like it is the interactivity between both that's going to be a critical part of the digital transformation journey. Absolutely. I think the, the the pace of change is really a critical point here. Where, where we used to see the equipment that was deployed in the field was going to be good for 20 years, 25 years. What we're now seeing is the tools that are available from a digital transformation standpoint are evolving in a period of months. Uh, and so the ability to uh, leverage the cloud to take advantage of that cutting edge uh, algorithms and analytics is really key. Uh, at the same time, you still obviously want to have equipment in the field that is robust enough that you're able to do the appropriate level of processing. Makes sense. And I think this next slide is really just a slightly different view um, than, than the previous. And this, this really helps you understand the activities that can change based on the monitoring and optimization requirements, both at the edge and the cloud. The important piece is ensuring that you have the most appropriate level of functionality to meet the discrete needs of each task and stakeholder. So that could be the plant operator that is making kind of real-time decisions um, that affect the viability for that plant. Um, it could also link up to the asset manager or the trader who also have different requirements in terms of the data that they need, when they need to see it, um, the depth of the data to make the most informed decisions moving forward, et cetera. So Sam or Bill, do you have anything else you want to add to this? 
No, I think one of the key points is really going to be continued market education about this because I, I think increasingly uh, companies are seeing in the in the power and utility space are seeing the change that cloud is driving in enterprise and they're looking at, okay, how do I get the benefits of that? Uh, but it, it's critical to understand exactly what tools you're deploying and what the benefits and trade-offs are. So I, I really think that's going to be a key piece in, in 2018. Uh, there's going to be a lot of, we're already seeing a lot of interest in this, but it's, it's really going to be around market education, making sure that people are making informed decisions. Makes sense. Okay, so hi everyone, it's Sam here from IHS and uh, I'm going to jump in and talk a little bit about the need for transitional technologies. Um, and in particular, I'd like to relate this to what was identified as the the most important trend when we uh, when we did the poll earlier, um, and that was around the power and utility markets um, and how the digitalization is, is impacting upon them. Uh, and the truth is that the grid is changing. The the requirements of the grid is changing. The way that people use the grid is changing, and the way that power is generated is changing. Um, and that is fundamentally bringing about a change in the way that the grid is operated and a change in the technologies that are required to, to maintain and, and run the grid. Um, and, and I'd like to talk a little bit about that now. Now, many people, uh, and I'm sure people will have seen this before, um, describe this change, I'm talking about the three Ds. Uh, those three Ds are, in my eyes, decentralization, uh, the concept that we're moving away from power from large centralized conventional power stations to much smaller distributed generation. Uh, decarbonization, moving away from conventional fossil fuels to sustainable renewables. And, and finally, digitalization, which, which I really don't need to, to introduce on, on this call here, but obviously the, the embedded intelligence and the added sophistication around all of these technologies is, is critical to, to the changes that I've been talking about. So, you know, at the very heart of this change is the fact that the solar and wind has become highly competitive with forms of power generation. But in particular, for me, that the key thing here is is that solar is a unique power generation technology, really, in the scale ability of it. So, what I mean by that is that we have people that are not even connected to the grid with a single solar panel through to some plants which are now up to a gigawatt in size um, in connected to, to main you know country grids and and that the re ultimate result of that is that this power generation is now embedded all throughout the grid you know we have it behind the meter in, in residential homes behind the meter in commercial and industrial sites as well as being used on the utility side of the meter for more centralized power generation um, and the key thing here is that it links to this this idea of decentralization which is it's somewhat driven by the consumer in my eyes because people are growing more and more interested in becoming autonomous from utilities and this is in some cases an economic thing uh, in some cases it is an emotional thing uh, people are just grow have a growing interest in the idea of resiliency um, even in the residential sector as well as the the c n i sector um, and autonomy and and this leads on to to even the idea of microgrids but I think it's interesting there is a statistic here some research that we've recently completed on grid defection that by 2020, if I look at the UK, Germany and Italy, 5% of power generation will be behind the meter, um, predominantly from rooftop solar. And that's a, a very meaningful proportion of, um, of the overall power mix. Uh, now, as I move on to the next slide, um, the, the, the sort of key transitional technology that I'd, I'd like to talk about here and, and um, 
and just describe and talk about its impact is, is energy storage predominantly batteries but this growing rise of, of renewables and what we typically refer to as intermittent generators um, you know obviously solar is only generated when the sun shines and, and wind is only generated uh, when the wind blows but also because it's behind the meter um, it's not always entirely predictable whether that power will even be fed into the grid or it's, it's essentially changing the, the requirements of the grid and making them much much more complex um, many people are now turning to, to battery energy storage to, as a way of providing additional flexibility um, in the grid and to balance this, this complex um, relationship between supply and demand, which is becoming more and more difficult. This uh, chart on the right here shows the, the global pipeline according to our analysis for battery energy storage on the utility side of the meter. And you, the interesting thing is that the pipeline is now very significant. Um, the projects are also getting built and it is spread around the world. So we see um, developments in all three major regions and um, countries like the USA, South Korea, Germany, and, and even the UK and Australia are really driving this market forward in terms of building out um, battery energy storage in their conventional power grids. Um, that, that was all I'd got prepared for this particular topic, but um, Scott, did, did you have any comments or did, did you want to add anything on top of what I've said here? Yeah, thanks, Dan. No, I think we strongly agree um, with all the points you made, I think just one additional point. I think in some ways, um, technology is leading the way. Um, I think the, the challenging aspect of this is that it's often ahead of where the policy or the regulatory environment is or where the capital markets are. So when you think about energy storage or you think about some of these other technology plays, how do you really value, um, a, you know, appropriately value um, those assets and the flexibility and the functionality within those assets as, as they provide services to the grid, to end customers, how do you stack those revenue streams, and then how, how do you ultimately kind of put, put financing behind those in an efficient manner that allows for real scalability? Moving on to the next slide and just kind of picking up on that theme, um, in the in the traditional kind of thermal power space, specifically here, we are starting to see um, a number of plants really shift into a different operational profile, um, and this is really a result of new technology that is coming onto the grid. That could be wind, solar. That could be more efficient gas plants, for instance. And, and a lot of these plants that are, that are shifting from a profile perspective, they were not necessarily designed to be that flexible. Um, but it's really critical for them to adapt to these changing markets or, or those projects are, are, are really gonna fail. Um, in fact, I was in a customer meeting yesterday um, with, with a large power producer that is um, moving towards construction for a large gas plant. And, and some, of the, some of the operational kind of profiles that they had underwritten against, um, really when they were developing the project, have already shifted. And they are looking to digital to provide the flexibility to shore up some of the revenue streams moving forward so that that project continues to be profitable. And so we think that there's an opportunity for digital to really um, enable enable customers, you know, greater flexibility around those assets to adapt to market conditions over time. Sorry, Scott, I, I hit the button a little too many times. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna chalk this up to user error. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Um, this last slide. Um, on this, on this particular trend um, points to two specific projects that we've been working on at GE. Um, the first is a hybrid electric gas turbine project 
that we've deployed along Southern California Edison. This project integrates a battery storage system with our LM6000 gas turbine um, that enables fitting reserve without fuel burn between demand events. Um, and this is really, you know, a first of its kind project. Uh, once online and synchronized, the turbine only needs two to three minutes to ramp up to full load because it has instantaneous response capability. Um, each in, in each hybrid EGT can participate in California's ISO spinning reserves market 24-7. Um, this project actually recently won accolades for the best power project and best energy storage project at the PowerGen International Conference here in the past two weeks. So we're really proud of this project. We see tremendous potential um, for really kind of augmenting the technology, um, you know, for certainly, you know, the LM plants across our installed base, but then also I think we are interested in, in looking about where we can kind of apply this concept more broadly. The second project highlighted here um, is actually a project that we're working on with the Department of Energy's ARPA-E program. Um, this, 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 this project, uh, the NODES project, stands for Network Optimized Distributed Energy System. And really the goal is to enable renewables penetration at the 50% level or, or, or greater by developing transformational grid control algorithms and architectures that optimize the usage of flexible load and DERs. And really the challenge is to reliably manage both locally or globally the dynamic changes in the grid by leveraging these additional re resources. Scott, I think um, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd just add something there. A bit. A trend that we've certainly observed is um, a grow, growth in, let me say that again, we've definitely observed a movement towards people batteries alongside conventional generators, uh, not just gas turbines, and it, it's a, a level of flexibility and fast response that the other technologies just, just can't do. Um, you know, in Germany, for example, there's a huge amount of batteries been built um, with conventional power stations in order to provide primary control um, or frequency regulation, and, and I think that this is a, a really important trend, and the combination of the different technologies is, is really interesting, uh, provides a lot of benefits, and we'll see a lot more hybrid developments like that in the future. Yeah, I think that's really interesting, too, from the perspective of um, the, the hybrid operations, because now, you know, when you were talking earlier about, the team was talking about the trade-offs that you have to make and the decisions, um, if, if, you know, you're really trying to reduce the amount of fuel you're using and you can offset the, the hot start or, or a warm start and take a longer ramp and use the battery storage as a way to meet your commitments on the grid and, and put less stress on, on the machines and be more economic in how you operate the, the, the whole environment, it really, again, opens up this opportunity to orchestrate more of the decisions you're making towards achieving a value and, and really driving towards your, your plant missions, especially as, it, as they shift from you know, what you were originally designed for to, to a whole new environment. I think it's going to extend the life of a lot of these assets much, much longer than, than they might have otherwise if, it, if they didn't have this hybrid technology coming, coming to save the day. Great point there. Yeah, absolutely. There's some great efficiencies and cost savings here as well, but by sharing a grid connection and sharing land, it can really you know, improve the economics as well. Um, it's important. You know, we've seen many examples of batteries being built with solar for example, that you know, the truth is there's no real relationship between the battery and the solar farm, but if you have the land, you have the grid connection, it's a, a lower cost way of developing the projects. Um, you know, and if there's an actual genuine relationship between the generator and the storage as well, then, then it's a win-win situation. Makes sense. So 
We've talked about a lot of the uh, key technology trends that we're looking at here, and, and most, if not all of them, rely on uh, one, digitization, which is a word we've heard <laughs> quite frequently, and two, really connectivity. Um, whether you're talking about connectivity to the cloud or local connectivity, and the more networked things become, the more security starts to become a, a pretty key topic. Uh, and it's not always been as strong a focus in this area, because a lot of the equipment, uh, legacy equipment certainly was more standalone, but as as we're moving into this kind of brave new area of, of industrial IoT and automating more of the grid operations, it starts to become a very serious discussion. Um, and, you know, how what's the best way for us to implement cybersecurity to really protect these assets, uh, protect operations? And so one school of thought is, well, okay, I'm just not going to connect stuff, and I'll, I'll be protected that way. And uh, there is an argument there, but you're obviously also limiting your uh, ability to take advantage of these technology trends, uh, the more practical approach is what we think about how do we, in the same way we're using technology to solve our grid and power distribution problems, how do we use technology to give us the best adaptive security protection possible? Uh, and that's really the key that we've been seeing in terms of the evolution of the cybersecurity market is we're moving beyond just traditional embedded security for new devices, moving beyond just uh, authentication and password protection. What we're moving into now is is really intelligence uh, and a lot of intelligence in the cybersecurity network and the firewalls um, and in the analytics that are behind the uh, uh, looking at the network traffic to make sure that there's an appropriate level of security validation, that you have visibility into all the different layers of your operation, that you're able to integrate with partners where appropriate, uh, suppliers where appropriate, uh, make sure that they are trusted, um, and you're able to actually use the technology to look for anomalous activity. And so you you move away from having a situation where there's been a, a breach uh, that it goes undetected potentially for months, and we've certainly heard about those often enough in the news, but it moves to a situation where as soon as there's anomalous activity on the network, it is noted, flagged, and um, raised uh, to a level of uh, appropriate management uh, to where you can recognize a breach or a problem within minutes or hours as opposed to that weeks or months. And that's going to be a key piece of this moving forward is that uh, you're really able to monitor this in real time and leverage all of that connectivity and intelligence that you're building into your network to, to improve and enhance your cybersecurity as well. That's great, Bill. This is Scott Brown. I agree with everything you just described. And in fact, we've been, we've been working hard um, on, on really this, this adaptive security space. One of the, the the, the byproducts of this is, is a technology called the di digital ghost, which really applies AI and machine learning to create a more sophisticated cyber defense system. We, we, we now have the capabilities to detect anomaly behavior and take corrective actions immediately and to isolate and remove the risk without impacting operations. And so this is, this is certainly an area of focus for us and our customers um, and, and strongly agree with the points you, you made around kind of how how this has to be really adaptive security measures going forward. When it's, I think a key piece there, just to tack one more, one more comment on there, is that because of the nature of the equipment and the technology, the communications protocols that are used in this space, while more broadly speaking, cybersecurity certainly in enterprise and commercial operations focuses heavily on IP security, you really need to be taking into account SCADA and, and ICS when you're looking at network level solutions in industrial environments. And that's where you need to have a partner that you're working with from a security standpoint who really understands those and that's integrated and baked into their solution from day one. Uh, it's not that you can just kind of take what works in one market and easily translate it to another. This is a specialized market that needs uh, kind of some specialized solutions. Yeah, Bill, it's, I think that's interesting too because, um, you know, earlier when we were brainstorming about this, you'd, you'd also mentioned kind of human aspect of security where we, we are really investing a lot in the technology from an IT and an OT perspective but we also have to think about the education of the humans that are interacting with the system and that their, be their behavior could also open up vulnerability because as we tighten some of the, the gates that the uh, ma malicious people would want to come in through from an IT-OT perspective, then they'll, they'll go to the other most vulnerable asset in an organization, which is our people. Any thoughts on that? 
No, it's absolutely the case. So in today, many of the uh, kind of highly publicized instances that we see, a lot of them still come back to some element of social engineering, whether it's a, a phishing email or targeted um, social engineering approach to glean some amount of information from, from a human resource who, who shares something uh, inadvertently that allows a third party to get access to your to your network. And that, again, is, is really critical when you start talking about adaptive security that it's able to intelligently look at uh, not only the traffic but the actors on the network and say, okay, is this, is this something this person should be doing? Does this even make sense in the context of what this person's role is? Yes, technically they may have access, but does it make sense within the context of your role? So you can question that. You can, you can make sure that the, the activity is valid and approved. Again, with, in the interest of if there is a problem, you, you significantly decrease the amount of time between when the intrusion takes place and when you're able to take action on it, because uh, that's that's really going to be a key message around cybersecurity, I think, moving forward increasingly. It's going to be, okay, something will happen at some point. How quickly can we respond to it? That's really the critical piece. How, do, how much can we minimize any sort of uh, potential uh, impact from this? Makes sense. So, Sam, can you, uh, can you fill us in a little bit more about what's happening on the e-vehicle horizon? Yeah, absolutely. Um, before I talk specifically about e-vehicles, uh, I think it's, it's important to, to think about one of the major things that's really behind the, the growth, and it also relates very closely to, to what we were talking about on the energy storage and the grid side um, earlier as well. Um, one of the major things underpinning growth in both sectors is the the improvements in battery technology and the improvements in battery costs. And this chart here shows IHS Market's um, broad outlook for lithium-ion battery modules in particular. And uh, we really see this in, in, let's say, phases. So the, the, the first phase, which, which is now behind us, where, where we saw batteries fall in price in 70% in five years, um, as the industry began to scale up, all probably behind the expectations of some, uh, we saw many uh, manufacturing facilities coming online that were underutilized, and this, the sector became very competitive, and, and that was one of the major things driving prices down. Over the next few years, what what it is that we expect is the competition will remain very, very fierce, but as volumes pick up, the, we'll start to see some stabilization in price. But one of the major factors really helping to continue driving prices down is, is lower cost manufacturing facilities coming, on in, on, coming online in China, where we see a huge amount of activity in terms of um, manufacturing for lithium-ion batteries. And then as we progress through, we, we start to see that technology continues to improve, allowing um, battery prices to, to continue um, their downward trajectory. But ultimately, we'll get to a point in the sort of mid-20s where, where we'll be in the sort of $100 to $150 per kilowatt hour range. Uh, and I should point out that this is an average. And this particular tr um, chart is intended to talk more about the um, utility scale grid storage than um, electric vehicles. Um, the, the shape of, of the curve is the same, but, but the actual levels of price are, are quite different. Um, and this improvement, this incredible improvement in cost, is, is one of the major things that is, is really helping to drive the, the e-vehicle um, market forward. Personally, you know, it's really difficult to talk about a tipping point as such. My personal belief is that we, we, we're probably there. There's been so many announcements recently from, from major manufacturers, you know, indicating that the electric vehicle growth is, is, is going to accelerate rapidly over the coming years. Um, I think it's well recognized in society as being a very real technology with a, a very important part in our future. Now, the, the main thing to highlight on this next slide is around the, the sort of impact that this is going to have on, on the elect, 
on the electric system. Uh, obviously, the addition of, of all of these cars to our roads, which will require um, charging facilities, could potentially have um, a significant impact on the, the, the requirements of the grid. And, and that obviously ties into to some of the trends we talked about earlier, in particular the transitional technologies, the need for flexibility in the grid, um, and the changing demands on the power and utility sector. Uh, you know, this chart here w would lead you to believe uh, the actual additional increase in, in electricity re demand uh, w would not be that significant in the, in the grand uh, scheme of the entire global electric s demand. But I think it's also important to think about the fact that it will also make a big change to, to how and when electricity is required. Um, you know, the places where it is required will change because cars will require um, charging facilities in, in many different places. Um, and of course, if, if every electric vehicle in the world was charged at, at the same time, maybe immediately after people um, return home from work, uh, they plug in their, their vehicle for, for the evening to, to charge ready for the following day. And, and, and that's going to really require a huge amount of intelligence to, um, to prevent any major issues for, for the electric grid. But at the same time, there is also the possibility that these electric vehicles and the batteries within them could in fact even be a very valuable, flexible asset for the grid. Uh, and in the future, I'm sure that we'll see huge developments in the, what's commonly known as vehicle-to-grid area, where we will actually see control taken over electric vehicles whilst they charge, um, enabling them to take part in balancing the grid, keeping it stable, and, and adding to that much-needed flexibility that I've mentioned several times. Uh, that, that was really all I wanted to say on, on this particular topic. Um, Bill, um, did you have anything that you wanted to add at all? Yeah, this is Scott. Um, I would say strongly agree. I think this is this is an area that we we watch very closely and have a number of initiatives kind of focused on this. Um, we do think kind of broader electrification um, as a theme, you know, provides a tremendous opportunity to to de decarbonize aspects of the industrial sector, um, and in this case, the transportation um, mobility space. Um, but as you mentioned, Sam also you know presents you know, meaningful grid and power infrastructure challenges and opportunities. And these are challenges that are that are really held by, you know, utilities and, and, and states and cities and policymakers. Um, if, if you just look at the current environment in California, you'll see that even some of the, the behind the meter kind of EV charging drives um, kind of load peakiness for um, some of those commercial properties. And so they've been um, deploying battery storage to clip that peakiness so that they're not in um, a higher tariff structure. And so you start to see, um, you know, as some of this infrastructure is rolled out, you've got consequences that may, that may um, you know, incentivize people to deploy other technologies. And so, you know, there has to be um, kind of a broader coalition that's looking at, you know, all of these issues playing out what those, you know, consequences or unintended actions may be. Um, but yeah, very, very in interesting space. All right, Bill, anything further or should we move on to artificial intelligence? No, I think it's in some ways it becomes a nice bridge to artificial intelligence. <laughs> um, what again, one of the consistent themes that we've seen and, and been talking about today, uh, especially as we start talking about digitization, is you have to start thinking about all the different data points uh, that we're talking about collecting and aggregating and analyzing. I know oh, in the industry in general has been using the term uh, big data and analytics somewhat casually over the last few years as, won't this be great? Well, get to a point where we're collecting all these data points because we've enabled intelligence in all these devices, um, and it's going to enable us to do all these wonderful things in terms of improving efficiency and uh, increasing productivity and, and uh, driving a more efficient system out uh, that's more dynamic and more responsive, which all sounds great in theory. And then you start to realize the volume and the magnitude of, of the data that you're dealing with and, and how significant that task is and how far beyond just traditional program, programming algorithms we've gone. 
And that's really where we start to move into this conversation around artificial intelligence, which is, it's a pretty broad term. It actually encompasses uh, there, there's several different kind of subsets of that. You have uh, kind of traditional machine learning, uh, which we've certainly seen in industrial automation and, and production uh, for the last decade. Uh, then moving beyond that, you have neural networks and deep learning, uh, which really are where you start to get into uh, pattern recognition, finding anomalies. And then artificial intelligence is really the point at which you're not just recognizing those and doing basic, uh, you know, kind of pattern changes to adapt to them, but really looking at very large sets of disparate data and making intelligent choices and adjusting, self-correcting and self-adjusting your algorithms based on that. So it's a, it's, a, it's a fascinating field, and it's going to be a really critical enabler, I think, to uh, move us from where we are today, where we've gotten very good at connecting things and collecting data, to the next stage where we're really able to take significant action uh, based on that data and really look at it and analyze it in real time, make real time decisions about how we need to adjust. And when we're talking about things like Scott just was with, you know, kind of real time management of the grid, uh, not just to improve performance, and remove peakiness, but also potentially to be taking advantage of things from a commercial standpoint in terms of tariffs and, and kind of optimizing your rate structure. Um, you know, when you start looking at how much machine intelligence you need behind that, now we've really moved fully into this uh, area of artificial intelligence as, as an enabler. That's great, Bill. And I'll jump in um, to this slide and then, and then the following slide. So certainly this is a space where GE um, you know, spends a lot of time and investment in terms of building out the capabilities um, for AI and machine learning um, for our software platform and certainly for the cu customers. This builds on a lot of the domain-based rules, expertise, algorithms that we've established um, by really collecting kind of you know, years and years of, of information on specific assets. I think what we've been able to do is really move beyond that and and you know apply those apply those domain specific rules and 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 software to to machine learning, you know, machine learning from other machines. Um, it's giving us deeper insights, it's giving us better confidence in the results, and it's giving us a better kind of lead time in developing those insights. For the customers them, themselves. If you go to the next slide, um, when you think about kind of AI and machine learning, obviously you think about the grid because it's 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 so complex and there are so many you know nodes on the grid that need to be optimized, and it seems like a very natural kind of use case um, for that technology. Um, I would say we're also seeing it on just very heavy industrial equipment. Um, and so uh, one example of that is our boiler optimization solution, um, which applies AI to power generation in a steam plant. And so leveraging sensors in AI, we can triangulate patterns across structured and unstructured data. And this really leads to insights related to specific maintenance activities that reduce O&M costs. Um, so again, you can see AI applications across the grid, but you can also see really impactful AI applications at an individual power plant where we're able to take in that structured and unstructured data to drive real insights. I think it's also kind of interesting too that it's a it's a combination of different kinds of analytical models, from physics-based models, dynamic models, adaptive learning models. Mm -hmm. and uh, thermal dynamic models yep. and physics-based stuff. And that orchestration of all these different kinds of techniques help refine and triangulate and, you know, take machine learning to that next level of, of artificial intelligence. Absolutely. And that's that's really the challenge, and I think you you encompassed it nicely there. When you when you're talking about these types of systems, there are so many different types of structured and unstructured data, and there's so many different models that you're trying to integrate into this, looking at different types of operations, all of which you want to at some level orchestrate and optimize. Um, you know that level of complexity is significant. It certainly uh, orders of magnitude beyond what we would have seen 25, 30 years ago, or what we were trying to adjust to 
manually 25 or 30 years ago with varying levels of success. But with the intelligence that we've now built into the equipment in the plant, um, you know, we're really able to take advantage of it with, with tools like this. That's amazing. Well, I can't believe it, team, but we've managed to make it through all of the trends that uh, we wanted to cover on today's call. And uh, I really want to make sure that everybody who's been tuned in has that opportunity to ask questions. Um, we've definitely been seeing some great questions coming in, uh, and I want to make sure we have an opportunity to address them in the few minutes that we have left. And so one of the top questions that you know, I also find interesting, so I'm kind of biased, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to select it out of the crowd, and it's to, um, I'm going to point it towards you, Sam. Uh, it's to ask, what are some of the main, you know, real drivers that are causing some regions to adopt re renewables sooner than, than others? Uh, thank you very much for the, the question. It's, it's a very interesting one, and we, we could have a, a whole series of webinars on this topic alone. <laughs> right. but, um, I mean, the, the fundamental thing is policy. Um, does a country have a, a policy in place that's going to drive the adoption of renewables? Maybe that looks like a mandate. Maybe that looks like a, an incentive scheme. Um, but that's obviously one of the number one things that drives deployment. It's also interesting to look at whether a country even has demand for power. Um, you know, some regions, particularly developing economies, just have a, a genuine need for more electricity um, for their population. Um, and in many of these places, distributed energy um, resources are a, a really, um, a really great way of providing that power. You know, potentially the the, the conventional grid doesn't reach certain community, for example. Um, uh, renewable microgrids, potentially with storage as well, are you know, a fantastic resource in that situation. Um, so that's interesting. And then, of course, there's just the, the, the economic point of view. In many cases, um, solar and wind are, are a very competitive form of power generation. And um, it's something that people will look toward when they're, they're looking at how they're going to plan for power generation in the future. So it, it's a huge topic, and uh, it's a fascinating one. And, but in a nutshell, that, that's why I see these, these differences. Makes a lot of sense. Thanks a lot, Sam. Um, I think, you know, we've got just a few more minutes left, and uh, we had about four or five questions come in. Um, so we might not get to all of them. We'll definitely follow up with you uh, afterwards. But one of the ones that was asked that I also think is interesting is, is you know, when you're talking about the scale of, of some of the um, systems that, that, that require intervention here with digital technology. So, so Scott, could you give us any other examples of some of the more large-scale um, projects that, that you've been working on? Yeah, well, certainly I think outside of NIPA and Exelon, I think one that is kind of close to home for GE is just our monitoring and diagnostic center. Um, I had the benefit of being in Atlanta a few weeks ago, and, and the scale of that digital transformation um, is in digital implementation is pretty staggering. So, so within um, that M and D center that runs on kind of the full Predix and APM suite, we have 500 power producers and utilities, and we're actively managing those assets. I think there are over 5,000 assets wow. under management. And and here's here's the number that I am still trying to get my head around that we analyze 200 billion tags daily. Of information, um, so I think I think um, I'd heard a few months ago when this was announced that this was you know likely the biggest kind of industrial internet um, digital application in the world, and it really is um, a staggering and impressive operation. So that's one um, that I wanted to highlight here, just because of the size and scale of it. Right. Wow. It is kind of mind blowing, blowing because the just the idea of kind of filtering through the noise to really select the most important things so that you can prioritize and and um, uh, activate on fixing those things and reducing risk as quickly as possible, reducing costs and and really trickling that down all the way across the entire the entire environment. It, it's it's pretty interesting the whole ripple effect. Well, I, I really want to thank all of our presenters today uh, for covering these really interesting topics. I think when the paper comes out, um, 
I, I really encourage you all to dive in a little bit deeper um, and circle back with with Sam and Bill and Scott um, through any kind of social media network that they're connected to and, and, and create your own dialogue with them. Um, I do want to remind everybody that this webinar will be available on demand and so you can continue to share the link with your colleagues or refer back to it as you need to um, and access it as an archive. And um, you know, use the resources list icon in order to download today's presentation and keep an eye out in your email for that separate uh, email that will come with the actual PDF of the paper that we'll be sending. Also, you know, we, we always host topics like this on our other webinars, and especially for the Electricity Value Network, um, and, and really trying to cover uh, topics that span every aspect of the Electricity Value Network. Uh, from technology demos for IT and operations to, um, you know, really pragmatic and, t and, and uh, tips on, on how to um, start your digital journey. So I want to thank everybody and our presenters for your time today, and uh, I really look forward to a fantastic 2018. Happy New Year, everyone. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Bill. Thanks. Bye, everyone.